our noses. We frequently see drugs and psychological brainwashing become part of the process of keeping them committed to the offender. The men will actually fly into Atlanta, get on the internet, say I want a boy who has no hair on his head, no hair anywhere, I want him to look like he's 13, I want him to be no taller than five foot two. Order, show up here, have sex, and be gone. Sexual exploitation of children has become a cottage industry driven by the internet. It's very difficult for us to define the problem with child pornography to the American public because it's something we obviously can't show them. There are some of the acts that I couldn't even describe to you against children so young that no normal person can look at that without being disturbed. jet lag and all the things you did to be here this morning to give 90 minutes of your attention to this issue. My name is Sheva Carr and I am here as the co-vice president of a UN peace messenger organization called Pathways to Peace and everyone on our panel delegation is a delegate of Pathways to Peace because human trafficking and the sex trafficking of children and women is a fundamental violation of our inalienable human rights. And we cannot create a peaceful and just world, as is the goal of Sustainable Development Goal 16, without addressing this issue. So what will it take to address this issue? I, I have to tell you, as panelists, we are coming to you with great humility today. There is no way that we can address such a complex, convoluted issue in 90 minutes. And if any of us really knew the answer to this question, what will it take to end human trafficking, then it wouldn't be happening. But we're here to start a profound conversation and to do what we can with what we do know and offer that into a dialogue with you and what you know so that together we can begin to end this scourge that ex-president and humanitarian Jimmy Carter has called the greatest human rights violation in the history of humanity. And this can be a heavy subject, but we are bringing a light heart of hope to it. Thanks to a very dear friend who just surprised me by walking in, but she's the surprise later. Um, what we have uncovered in our research is that media is part of the problem. Media is part of the poison 
that is perpetuating human trafficking, but it has the extraordinary potential to be the antidote. And when we say media, we mean all media. Print media, television, film, movies, video games, online media, posters, billboards. Everywhere we look, our brains are being influenced and our hearts are being influenced by information. And in our investigation, we have seen that media is perpetuating the problem in profound and dangerously unnoticed ways. And that media has the tremendous potential. And here among our panelists, in some cases, the astonishingly realized potential to be the antidote. And we're very excited to share that hope with you today. So I'm gonna start on a note of hope and say that even mainstream media is being, beginning to get involved in this. There is the CNN.com Freedom Project, which two journalists at CNN started. And it is an extraordinary resource of personal stories about human <coughs> trafficking that take the 21 million, which is a figure that none of us know is accurate. But we think 21 million trafficked persons in this world, and already there's disagreement because we have no accurate data on this. The infinite number of souls, devastating number of souls, let's say that, who are being trafficked and making their stories personal so that they're not just lost numbers but are touching the hearts of mainstream audiences. Another success story is Half the Sky. How many of you have read or heard of Half the Sky? Yes. This, the hands up in this room, is a success story. A Pulitzer Prize winning book also by a journalist. And this one is more interesting to me in some ways because it is an example of what we're now calling in the media industry trans media. So Half the Sky became a PBS documentary and now it's become an interactive game, a video game. So it's reaching the engagement of audiences where they engage. And we'll be talking about <coughs> the potential transmedia has to play an uplifting role <coughs> in this today. But there are also incredible grassroots efforts happening, not just CNN. And that's what we're here as panelists to share with you, the impact that we can have. You know, we're living in an unprecedented time when almost anyone, including a street child I work with in Nicaragua who doesn't have shoes but has a cell phone, can be a media creator. And I wanna turn my attention today to some of my media heroes. And I, forgive me if I cry. Because I am so blessed to be introducing you to Libby Spears and Nishima Chudasama, the creators of the film clip that you just saw, which was one of the primary influences in my life that got me off the couch and involved in making a difference for this issue. Welcome, Nishima and Libby. of child sex trafficking victims are sold online, and 30% of these victims are boys. Can't hear? No. Turn the mic up. Um, is that better? Yeah. Any better? Can everybody hear? I apologize. Time change, early morning. My voice is not as powerful as usual. 
Um, news headlines echo these grim facts, but beyond this informational overload, which can often leave us feeling numb, is a child with a story. As a filmmaker, I am drawn to stories that are often overlooked. In 2005, I started filming Playground in Indonesia, and Sunni was one of the first victims I interviewed. At age 12, she was sold to a brothel by her best friend, a brothel where 600 other women and girls had also been sold. Unfortunately, Suni's story was only one of hundreds that I filmed while filming throughout Southeast Asia. I returned to the United States and came across a piece in the New York Times Magazine that Peter Landisman had written about girls who were being trafficked from Mexico into California to service the agricultural workers in the strawberry fields. And I thought this would be a good ending to this film. It talked about trafficking overseas, a way in which we can bring the story home. I went to DC and I met with Ernie Allen, the founder of the National Center of Missing Exploited Children. And I you know, referenced the story to Ernie and said, I'm looking for other stories to tell that are similar to this, to make Americans care about what's happening overseas. And Ernie's response was, I don't know of any other stories of kids being brought into America because you don't have to bring children into America to sexually exploit them. But I can tell you thousands of stories of kids that are being trafficked every day in their communities, in their cities, and across state lines. I chose, but I, but I basically asked Ernie, like, where is this happening? He said, it's happening anywhere. Wherever, child, wherever drugs are being sold, children are being sold. And I really wish you would tell this story. So this was probably 2006, 2007, and there were a lot of other people that were talking in the media, other filmmakers that were making films about international trafficking. So for me, it felt important to tell that American story. So I chose Portland, Oregon as my first location for no other reason than the fact that I was broke after two years of filming and I had a free place to stay in Portland. But within 24 hours of being there, uh, I picked up the local paper and there was a follow-up story about an 11-year-old girl named Michelle, which you saw in the clip earlier, who had been trafficked from a mall in Portland, Oregon to Vancouver, British Columbia. But as I investigated further, I learned that trafficking doesn't happen in a vacuum. Prior to Michelle being trafficked, she was taken from her home at the age of five because she was in an abusive home and put into the state's care. She was put into 36 placements between the ages of five and the ages of 12. And within those homes, we know of six that she was sexually abused in. I was shocked to see firsthand that children were being tra trafficked in our own backyards. But what was most shocking to me is the perception of how Americans perceive victims. When I talked about Sunni and other girls I interviewed in Southeast Asia about what happened to them and them being victims, people recognized these girls as being victims. But when I talked about Michelle, she was seen as a bad kid who made bad choices, not as a victim. My goal for the film became clear. In order to have a meaningful impact on the issue, I had to humanize the facts and create connections beyond the headlines by showing that Michelle and others like her were in fact victims just like Sunni. And if the film could change public perception, laws would follow and resources would be unlocked. We would then have the capacity to address all of the systems that had failed Michelle. To a certain degree, this, true, this proved to be true. Michelle's story became a powerful call to action. Playground became a tool that could help transform the way American victims of trafficking were treated and perceived. The film was screened in communities around the world. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children hosted a screening in Dallas for 800 uh, police officers. And at the end of the screening, there was a line outside of the door with, I would say, around 100 men in law enforcement coming up to me and apologizing and saying, I didn't know, I didn't know that these, I've arrested these girls in the streets. I didn't realize they were victims. They understood that the girls they had been criminalizing were, in fact, victims and they needed to be treated as such. We also use Playground to help change legislation. One of the first screenings of the film was held at the home of Senator Boxer where several senators, including Ron Wyden, attended. That screening, that screening prompted Senator Wyden to sponsor federal legislation. All throughout, people connected with Michelle's story and were able to empathize with her vulnerability. It's this empathy that began to help change frontline responses and encourage public demand for laws that protect victims instead of criminalizing them.
I founded the Nest Foundation to manage the awareness building we knew was possible through the film, the most important element of which is youth education. And I now want to introduce my colleague, Nishima Chudasama, who helps our youth education programs. Everyone, can you hear me okay? Yeah. No? How about this? Louder? Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. My, my diaphragm. Um, I get to talk about all the things we've done with Playground, which, which is, is this, uh, there's something <coughs> here to see you should not. Um, so our youth education program, you know, has really been where we put a lot of attention with, um, with Nest's work currently. Just building, in fact, on a lot of the community screenings um, and the trainings we had. So often we would get requests from folks in the audience just like you saying, you know, you've created this incredible tool. How do we use it with young people? How do we get into high schools? Um, and so we rallied the call, especially because for us, engaging this younger generation in an issue that's quite frankly affecting them the most um, is one of the you know one of the things that we wanted to contribute um, and when we talk about bringing playground into the classroom you know many of you looking at or remembering uh, viewing that clip and how intense it can be um, may kind of have a note of concern but actually we've kind of used our time in the classroom to make sure that we're presenting the information in a way that gives young folks the vocabulary, the critical thinking skills, the framework with which they can really understand what makes trafficking thrive, why this is happening. Um, and we want to make sure that young people are feeling empowered, they're feeling savvy, um, and that they're feeling, you know, if we take a broader step out, as like they are um, actively participating in shaping their culture. Um, you know, as Sheva has said, media can so often contribute in, you know, whether it's tacitly or often overtly in creating an environment that normalizes rape culture, that normalizes misogyny, that hijacks masculinity and defines it in very, very one-dimensional ways. Um, and so, you know, after kind of using the first few lessons to really impart prevention strategies around you know, identifying what is grooming, what does that look like online, what does that look like offline, um, you know, talking about bystander behavior, talking about um, uh, sexting even, you know, things that, you, that we may not necessarily immediately connect with trafficking, but in fact create vulnerabilities um, that, that can often lead to forms of exploitation for young people. So we're kind of giving, you know, all these disparate elements this larger context. And by the fifth lesson, when we screen this video, uh, which I will spare you all, uh, I don't know if any of you remember the song from a couple of summers ago, Blurred Lines, it's very catchy. Um, but once you listen to the lyrics, it's basically referencing date rape. And um, some of the images in it are, you know, I mean, there's a guy kind of blowing smoke in, in, a, in a model's face. It's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's not only uh, presenting women as objects, but it's also kind of defining masculinity in terms of power, money, and callousness. So both boys and girls are affected by this, and we want to make sure that we're speaking to boys as well as girls and not alienating anyone, but inviting them to participate as makers of their culture. So we have them deconstruct you know, media that they're consuming, we have them look at print ads, and all throughout we ask them, you know, from where you are, you're a 15-year-old kid, you know, what can you do from where you are to help kind of um, disrupt these paradigms, you know, disrupt the status quo? And we have this beautiful solutions mural that carries as a thread throughout our uh, six lessons and collects the ideas of young people. And it, whether it's as simple as I can talk to my little brother about the words he uses, you know, you know, let's think about the word ho and let's think about the word quote pimp. Like what, what are the, the what are these uh, words carrying on? This, this keeps popping up, huh? Um, you know, what are these words really um, uh, evoking, you know? And, and how, how can you kind of use more appropriate language? So, you know, these young people kind of 
um, you know, also are, are clear about their power on social media. They spend so much time on Snapchat and Kick and other apps that I'm constantly learning about, but how can they also use, you know, their voices as young people, like a 17-year-old or 14-year-old kid did with Seventeen Magazine, you know, um, starting a petition and urging them to, to be more responsible with their presentation of young women. So kind of empowering young people to use their voices, you know, to shape media by using our media, by using Playground, um, you know, has kind of helped us um, connect the dots. And in the end, they end up, you know, you know uh, recording speeches for leaders. They, you know, one group um, did a rap video, you know, another group um, did a, I mean, they've just done so many different things. I can't like they're all running through my mind because they're, they're just so inspiring. But uh, by the sixth lesson, they're really ready to, to, to do something about this issue. Um, so much so that we've created youth forums. And the next step in our, in our curriculum process is to have young men and women on stage with the district attorneys of their, of their states, with, um, with state legislators, with other leaders, speaking directly with them and saying, you know what, we want to do something about this issue. Um, and so for us, you know, this diagram kind of represents a, a way in which we believe as filmmakers, a compelling story truly can act as the heart of social change. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll continue this cycle over and over again. Um, so that's the work we do with Playground and at, at Nest, we continue to make other films that we hope inspire action. Um, and if you'll allow, we'll play about um, a five minute clip from another short film we've created called Jessica's Story, which celebrates an incredible young woman in Los Angeles. Can I say one thing? Yes. Just to say that we recognize that there is a voice disturbingly missing from our panel, and my apologies for that. Uh, all of the representatives from this community fell through for us. But it, it's, it's um, a little unconscionable to me to have a panel about human trafficking without the voice of a traffic survivor. And so Jessica is going to be that voice in absence of that today. Are we able to do the lights? Uh, can someone cut the lights, please? Thank you. There you go. Don't let the battle fall. So there they go. You know. Sexual abuse started at three years old, and it continued to happen until I think I was about six. I felt like my mom really just didn't protect me, and I felt like she didn't care and she didn't love me. My mom had a lot of different boyfriends, men that have tried to sleep with me, tried to get different sexual favors from me. Some have been forceful. I was molested by my mother's writing partner when I was um, a kid. And I've passed on other projects like this because I didn't want people to just think of me as this person who had all these terrible things happen to them. But when I heard Jessica's story, I thought, you know, now's the time. It's important. What happened to her is important. What happened to me is important. I was 17 years old. I remember I had two long ponytails and I was followed. They said, oh, you remind me of Pocahontas. And I was like, they had a gun. I was afraid. They told me not to scream or they were gonna beat the hell out of me. There were maybe between 15 to 20 men there and I was raped in the car all night. That's when I got branded on my neck. After I was branded, the next four years were unimaginable. I was snatched up, I was hogtied, put in trunks, I was um, pistol whipped, I had to like jump tuck and roll out of cars, I've had to, I've just gone through everything. I've been beat up, I've been raped. It was like one thing after another, and I think that's when the, the trauma really fully set in for me. At any moment, anybody could kill me. 
the pimp that I was with, his pimp partners had girls in dog cages. They were waterboarding them. They were selling them. They raped them on end. The girls were like using the restroom in the cages. Basically, they were trying to break these girls and they had other guys coming in, having sex with them, getting paid. When Jessica told us her story, I asked her if there was any point where she felt like she saw things that made her feel safe or happy and all this terrible traumatic stuff that happened to her. She always loved to see hummingbirds because it reminded her of her grandmother. It was the only time there was no extra stepfather or man living in the house to abuse her or take advantage of her. So we've decided to do two hummingbirds so this one would be her daughter and the one up on top is facing her so that would be her grandmother protecting her and hopefully she'll like them i love hummingbirds and i could never catch them yeah. so <laughs> they're just you know they i think they symbolize like a, a freedom a certain type of freedom made a wrong turn once or twice dug my way out blood and fire I got out of the life eight years ago. I was 20, I'm 28 now. And having my daughter living with me is so amazing. I had her when I was 16 and she was taken away from me for a while and that was really painful. But I found some balance in my life with a lot of support from my mom. My mother and I have a really wonderful fantastic relationship now and she's apologized to me for a lot of things that has gone on and she's really worked on being in my life i now work at helping girls leave the street life really not safe out here for anyone especially for children a lot of the girls are anywhere from 11 on up and sometimes even younger than that I love my girls, each and every one, and I even write them, like a letter or a personal note, so they know that I'm thinking about them, even when they're not here. I add stickers sometimes because, you know, even though it's something so small, like just something, the smallest things make you smile. Thank you so much. I love the eyes, especially. The eyes, it says I've been through something, but it's a certain strength that's like in the eyes. And I think it's, I think this is beautiful. <laughs> I'm so glad you like it. <laughs> oh, this is great. <laughs> Thank you. You look pretty. You made me look wonderful. Granddad, that hummingbird is for mama. Grandma. Even yes. It really has. If it wasn't for you and Mama, though, I don't know. I'm a survivor of sex trafficking. I've overcome that. And all my girls, they will too. You know, one thing I just, there's so much there and so much to digest, yes. <laughs> it's an emotional morning for many of us. But one thing I wanna highlight here representing a UN Peace Messenger organization is this. We are here at the NGO CSW as civil society to make our contribution and not wait for policymakers to do it for us. And that's what Libby and Nishim are doing, but one of the purposes of framing our work as NGOs in the Sustainable Development Goal conversation is so that it becomes a bridge to policymakers, so that we become their hands and feet on the ground, so that we can work together 
And that's exactly what you guys have done by showing playgrounds in the Senate and getting the Senate to change policy so that we can walk arm in arm and together make a difference with this. And there is one organization that is perhaps my favorite organization in the world. <laughs> I always knew media could make a difference, but I never saw it in action until I met Sean Saudi at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women three years ago. And he introduced me to Media Impact, which is in this building, and it is media that is having a profound impact. Sean, thank you for being here. Good morning, and welcome everyone. As Sheva said, we're based in this building. We've been based in this building for 30 years, and I've been here for six years. And it's always a special period when we have all of you visit, and our floors get overwhelmed, our elevators get overflowing, and we all have to uh, meet each other very intimately as we go up and down these floors. So make sure you turn to someone in that elevator and introduce yourself, because it's a very special community that gathers here for these two weeks. Uh, my name is Sean. I have the great pleasure of being CEO of PCI Media Impact. We're a ECOSOC 501c3, 501c3. We believe in the power of stories to change the world wonderful group of um, women's based small NGOs out of Bolivia on this work and as we've gone through the, the three or four years we've now worked on this other partners have come on board but it started with uh, a deep commitment to that local voice and that local capacity that's important for many reasons it's important because they bring the formative research to the table they bring the real-life experience of knowing what that issue looks like in their community. It makes our stories real, makes our joint productions meaningful, it makes it touch your heart, which is how to touch people's heads. So we mentor them through the process of production. Um, we produce content. I believe, and I think my colleagues at the table believe, good content drives good conversation, and it's from conversation that change happens. You can't go from content to change. You need that place in the middle where people talk about that content. Whether it's a husband and wife at home, whether it's a daughter and a child, whether it's happening in a classroom. So we consciously design our programs to touch all aspects of that conversation potential. I, um, I can't play you the drama because it's an audio drama in Spanish. It really went out. <laughs> trying to silence us. Uh, and we're back. Um, but I, we, like Sheva said, we're big fans of transmedia work. So we produced a short animation on the drama, which was played across the different television stations around Bolivia, trying to get ensure people actually listen to the drama on the radio. The radio drama itself is 28 episodes, 12 minutes long. Uh, it comes with a user guide and, and is handed out extensively, so you can uh, come and see me if you're interested in getting a copy. Let me play you the animation now. Simón, hola Simón. Yo ya quiero entrar a clases, por eso me niego. ¿Será que lo dejan? Sentate aquí a mi lado. Ven. Todos me están mirando. Ven más cerquita, vas a hacer conmigo. Vamos chicos, vamos. Sí, ¿y has hablado con tu mami? Dice que está bien. ¿Por qué tu mamá no ha ido a trabajar al mismo país que mi papá? Dice que es lleno de tiendas, de luces, y ella no quiere ir. Señor. Dios, ¿qué hago? ¡Despierte! ¡Despierte! Ma, mi papá está perdido. ¿Y si le ha pasado algo? ¿Y ahora? ¿Tienes hambre? Sí, pues, yo también. Solo hay cebolla, parece. Comeremos esto hasta que llegue la madrina, ¿ya? Pero tú terminate esa que ya has mascado. Sí, no. ¿Qué haces en la casa? ¿No has vendido? Hola. Hola, Canela. Se llama Alfonso. 
Y está en la universidad, todo se ve diferente cuando estoy con él. ¿Esto es para ti? El Alfonso me gusta. Me separaría de ti un segundo. Apurá, Canela. Vamos, hay que volar a la terminal. Canela. Escuchen. Su compañera Canela González ha desaparecido. Oiga, Canela no aparece. No está Canela. Te vamos a encontrar, niña. Danos las pistas. Danos las señales. Tienes que salir de este lugar, Canela. ¿Papi? ¿Papi? Sí, soy tu papi. ¡No! ¡No! ¡No, por favor! Vamos, señor X. So that gives you a little bit of a sense of the story. As you can see, it, it tries to address the depth of the issue that is trafficking. It includes labor trafficking as well as sexual trafficking. It is an incredibly complex issue. Um, the situation in Bolivia where we worked was particularly hard. Traffic has increased 900% over the last decade. These are astronomical numbers. When you combine poverty with uh, complex environments, you can often get uh, these situations exacerbate quickly. There's a, a, a tradition in rural Bolivia where they send their um, young children into the, the capital, La Paz. And when you separate children from their natural parents and put them in a, in a family-based home situation, semi-home situation, it just facilitates that type of abuse being a little more easy to happen. Um, we started working on this work in 2012. We were very lucky to get a grant from the U.S. State Department, who's been working with us the whole time. It's an issue I know is very dear to their heart and the one they're working to overcome. We produced uh, 21 episodes of drama, 12 minutes each, which we broadcast on 150 different radio stations in Bolivia. Now, Bolivia is one of the radio capitals of the world. It was a deep part of their culture. Through the, it was used uh, as part of the mining industry. 150 radio stations, each with their own call-in shows. So imagine 21 episodes, 20, 150 stations, an hour long. Think of how much conversation that is on the airways and how many conversations that provokes at home. And that's why we think it makes a difference. But we were really excited because while it started on air, U.S. State Department got excited by the production and said we should take it into classrooms. And so they worked with us to produce kits for children to go across Bolivian schools. So we take the drama into the school. As I showed you, we have these guides with the episodes in the back, so it's very easy for a teacher to know what to talk about in each episode as it talks them through some of the issues and some of the, the cases. But we also produced little books so that the children could draw and make real the story for them through their own creative process. We complemented that with um, plays in public spaces. Those of you know Latin America know that the public space culture is, is very rich. Now we've done this now since 2012. We've done pre and post surveys. We've had teachers write and students write. But the story I want to close with is one that really happened as the drama first went on the air. What we all aspire to is one less child times a million less children suffering this work. So when we heard after we were on about episode six of our show and the local community in one of our, the, the areas we were, a group of young girls were listening to the show. And they realized that one of their friends was following the path of Canela. And so they reached out to her and they got her to talk to their parents, talk to them, and this girl decided instead of going off to La Paz and pursuing who knows what, she went back home. It's my hope that there are not one of those stories, but thousands of those stories, and if we all work together, millions of those stories. Thank you very much. We are on the fifth floor to come and visit. We love visitors. That's how I'll 
all this got started, I showed up on the fifth floor after seeing Sean present at the CSW. So, I want to honor that we had hoped this would be a conversation, but really, as you can imagine, for a, as a facilitator, it's pretty hard to stop any one of these amazing speakers and cut them short. So, we don't want to cut our interaction with you short. And we won't get to talk with all of you individually. Um, my husband, a fellow co-vice president of Pathways to Peace, will be handing out around sign-up sheets. And you're hearing a lot about transmedia. So we are actually here today launching a new transmedia project, and we need the participation of other NGOs so and civil society from all walks of life. So if you'd like to be in touch with us about this, we encourage you to sign up on these sign-up sheets that are going around. There's one aspect of Sean's presentation that I want to click on. And this next piece, I'm just going to acknowledge of our panel, maybe in some ways the most controversial. Um, and that is, you could see in the, uh, in the cartoon, the grooming that goes on, yes? Now, as we mentioned, trafficking is a very complex, multifaceted issue with many vectors of implementation. But one of the primary vectors that you've heard a lot about this morning is grooming. And so, we're going to talk a little bit about grooming with someone who used to do it. The art of war several thousand years ago, written several thousand years ago, said, the enemy you know becomes your ally. Yeah. Yesterday it was said that until we change the perception of men and boys, we will not change the status of women in this world. I want to acknowledge that in our delegation at Pathways to Peace, Half our delegation are men, and all of them are in this room, and I thank you. And one of those men has gone through a profound transformation in his life that we hope every man involved in this does. And it is, I hope you can appreciate his courage in standing in front of you. It is actually a pleasure to introduce Winston Wright. Winston, do you want to come up here? Is his mic on? Yes, it is. It is. Yes. Yes, of course. So Winston and I are going to speak together. Um, Winston, this is the first time you've seen these clips. That's right. Yeah. Can I tell a little bit of your story, or do you yes, want to tell? Yes. You can tell. Winston became a human trafficker at the age of 14 years old. The vector along which that happened is almost identical to the traffic victim stories that we've heard today. He was abused at home in all dimensions of his life. He was a runaway. He was without food or shelter, crying in a subway station, and it went from there. So to understand the issue of human trafficking, we have to understand why someone becomes a trafficker and know what interventions would both prevent that and rehabilitate that. And Winston, I think it's very important for all of us to establish here today how you feel now about what you did for 35 years. It took him 35 years to break free, and that's what he calls it. And his story of breaking free is an incredible one, and um, one that we're telling in a documentary that's in creation right now. But um, how do you feel about it now? I'm sorry for what I did to the woman. I'm ashamed. I, uh, I, I, I trafficked a lot of women uh, overseas and national. Um, Winston is now that he's free. 
working diligently on his rehabilitation and also on turning his attention to helping NGOs like ours to understand this issue better and what we can do to stop it. And we really thank you for your help, Winston. Because Winston has changed my understanding of what drives this. So this fairy tale that you see here, Cinderella, is one that billions of girls worldwide see. What is this story really? Every woman in this girl's life is cruel, awful, and evil. They're even called the evil stepsisters and the evil stepmother. And she prays for a man, a prince <coughs> charming, to come and rescue her from this horrid life. And when he shows up, she has beautiful clothes and lives happily ever after. The enemy you know becomes your ally, and the enemy to our little girls is Prince Charming. And this story that is priming them for exactly the way, the vector along which human trafficking happens. Is that a familiar story to you, Winston? That's right. Um, I, uh, I brainwashed, I brainwashed uh, the women that I human traffic. I, um, I didn't use drugs to get them, but I, use, I, I brainwash, I brainwash them. Um, when, you, when, you, when you brainwash the women, they stay with you longer. Um, uh, you make them fall in love with you. And then you start uh, taking them to the, to the strip bars. to the clubs where the pimps and the prostitutes hang out so they get, so they get intrigued with the lifestyle. And, uh, so we really, really want to share with you Winston's freedom <laughs> and how he broke out of this cycle. And I was going to uh, I was depressed one day. I decided to uh, go away for a while. So I, I spin the, I had a globe. I spin the globe, I close my eyes, and I, I landed my, my finger up in the globe, landed in Colombia. Now I am, um, so I decided to go there. Now, I, I, I used to traffic in Colombia. Iceland and Holland and Italy. And, um, so I decided to go to Colombia. Uh, just to on a vacation and have fun. Had sex with girls and uh, maybe getting made them, made, made them come to uh, to Canada on an entertainment visa to work. So I'll go to the, to the strip bars. The so I went to the, I saw a friend and uh, I asked him, where's the strip bars? He says, you'll take me to the strip bar the next day. So the next day I met up with him that afternoon and uh, we went downtown in Bogota. As we were going to the, to the strip to the strip by he said we're gonna cut through the gonna cut through the church. I went inside the church and I uh, I saw people praying in the church and about I look around and I saw saints, there was lots of saints. It was called the Church of San Francisco. And uh, what happened was uh, I felt something in the church. And I, I, there was a lot of people praying in, uh, in the church. I felt something, and I, uh, I started crying. I, uh, I felt the Holy Spirit. And, um, that happened in 2003. I, I, I stopped right there. I didn't get a chance to go to the stripper. Or I can make ever that again. ever again. <laughs> and I, I told my, uh, my, the people I worked for in human trafficking, that uh, I, 
I'm done with that. And uh, they won't understand. understand and that's, that's no small accomplishment, and we don't have time to go into it today, what it takes for a trafficker to get out. But what we need to focus on, and thank you for your vulnerability, Winston. I know this is hard. And he knows that he's speaking to many of you who wouldn't be able to forgive him, and we understand yeah, that. Yeah, I understand that. But it's not stopped him from standing up and trying to make a difference on this issue. And the piece we're here to focus on today, because this is so complex and there's so much going on, but we have to understand that if a child, and a boy child, is never shown any love or any contact with a meaningful core value, only abuse, and then sees images like these. <coughs> and I just want you all to take a moment and ask yourself, who do you think these images are targeted at? And how do you feel looking at these images? How do you think a little girl feels looking at these images? How do you think a 14-year-old runaway boy feels looking at these images? I did not have to troll the internet to make this slide. I just entered girls in advertising in Google. These are normal print ads. We have normalized the objectification of our girls and the sexualization of our girls. And that is affecting not just girls, but also boys. When we turn ourselves into two-dimensional sexualized objects and associate that with monetary value, I'm embarrassed to show you this slide. This was posted as Kim Kardashian's celebration of the International Day of Women this year on March 8th. On Twitter, 60 million hits in 24 hours. That's monetizable for her. Is this not a form of trafficking? And these are girls and boys clicking on this and liking it and seeing that the value of a woman is in the sexualization and objectification of her body and not her sexuality not her ownership of her direct experience, but her as an object to be looked at and done with what is wanted by someone else. And that conditioning is influencing not just the girls, but it's also influencing the boys because treating women that way is glamorized. Winston looked up to statesmen when he was a child and he was told that he was stupid and could never be one of them. So do you know who the next who the next role model in his world was on the streets. Winston, tell us, so in your recovery, yes. you've had to make some choices and disciplines. Yes, I had to uh, um, not look at the internet, right? Because if I look at the internet, I, I see pornography, uh, I go into pornography, I had to stop, look, watch, go to the strip bars, <laughs> And, uh, I, um, and stuff like that. And what about Plus, music? And, and the music is very, that's the main one. Thank you, the music. So what music do you listen to now, Winston? <laughs> Don't stay. <laughs> when he goes to the gym to work out, he has to wear jersey and his headphones. He's not indoctrinated by the music they play at the gym. This is what our media is doing. And this is the impact. Terry Crews, who is a famous NFL star and now a television actor, has come online to, to speak this truth. When we objectify ourselves as two-dimensional images in media, we come to see each other as body parts and objects for use. Is this not how we're also exploiting our planet? We stop seeing each other as human beings to love. And imagine what that does to a little boy's mind who has never experienced love. If we're going to heal human trafficking, we have to address this issue. And we are engaging in a project that will touch the Winstons of our world, hopefully before the traffickers can script them.
Winston, is there anything else you want to say? I'm, I'm really sorry. And um, I want the help to try to stop this human trafficking. And Thank you. Thank you. Research that was done by Albert Bandera in the 1960s showed us that children emulate exactly what they see on TV. They did a study with a bogo doll. Sean, I almost think you should speak to this, but since we have so little time. So they, the quick thing is this, and, and the study is actually online and you can read about it. It's a fascinating one because there's gender differences in it that are interesting. We don't have time to go into today, but the essence is Half the children saw an adult on TV punch the bobo doll, and half the children saw an adult on TV hug the bobo doll. And guess what the children did when they were allowed into the room where the bobo doll was after they watched what the adult did on TV? What did they do? They emulated their, what the behavior they saw in media. It is our social responsibility to begin to fill the airwaves with positive interactions between men and women that show us our humanity, connect us to our loving capacity at heart, and to model new possibilities and new dynamics of interaction and behavior. And that is exactly what our next speaker, Tess Cacciatore, is doing through her work at the Gwen Network and a film that she is releasing this week, Road to Redemption. Welcome, Tess. Should I just play the clip? Yes. Lights off, please. <coughs> it all began with a glow, and I trace my fingers along the many countries and oceans that bind us all. Senator's daughter saves lives in Africa. My name is Double. We have it have you. Nigeria. Let's turn to the patients. Our community has been struck by a great affliction. Our women cannot provide us men for with children. They have the cars. Thirteen. Pregnant at 13. Women here marry very young. I am cursed. Jemima was caught in bed with another man. This poor girl is not cursed. She's sick. For just $300, she can be healthy. This is a place for sick people, not for sinners. The girls in the tent. This is festival. These girls are too young to have children. Please, take me with you. These children are your wives? If your children cannot speak, speak for them. You came here to fulfill your dreams and fantasies. You're not one of us. I just saw a man get murdered. I can't deal with this. She is a bad woman. She brings only death with her. I have no idea what I was fighting. Our culture has been around for hundreds of years. Really, he says in what she says. You cannot expect it to change overnight. Your father's a United States Senator, Smith. My being here is ruining my father's chances of re-election. You've come to fix things, or should I say me? And who are you to question the evidence? Maybe you should ask yourselves, what's worse, running away? We're staying and doing nothing. I need to get back to Lagos. The people need you. You have brought nothing but shame and trouble to this community. Obviously, I don't know what I'm doing. She came to offer her medical expertise, not to question the traditions of our She's here as a volunteer. I don't even know what I'm doing. The doctor knows best. Change me and stop 
laying in the bed of our husbands. Must we be so stubborn about this? WEN <laughs> um, stands for Global Women's Empowerment Network. And we're transforming lives beyond abuse. It's a very emotional topic for us all. So forgive me if I have to breathe a lot through this. As Shevin knows, I can talk for hours about this topic and many others about the atrocities that are going on in the world. So I had to write down my thoughts so I could stay within the time limit. So as I was preparing, let me see where we are here. This is going to the slide, Yeah. And now that is here. <coughs> <coughs> Can you hear me okay? So as I was preparing for the Commission on the Status of Women, I was faced with the idea of what it all meant to me and what I could do to make the necessary changes. <coughs> last Wednesday, that's not my slide. <laughs> Let's forget the slides. So last Wednesday, I'll do this one right here. Okay. So last Wednesday I received a newsletter. Uh, it's one that comes out to the Hollywood industry to let people know what's going on. And most of the time I delete the newsletter because it has stuff that I don't really care about. It's a lot of fluff and a lot of reality TV. But this one morning I clicked on a link and it was about a new series called The Underground. I'm not sure if you've seen it yet, but it's on TNT and it's about the Underground Railroad. It's about people being freed from slavery. And the trailer jolted me down memory lane because I got back to the age of nine. And I was growing up in, I grew up in Des Moines, Iowa, and I was obsessed with this historical shero of mine, this amazing woman by the name of Harriet Tubman. I realized at a very young age how the telling of the story could impact millions of people, especially when telling the story is about how one woman made an impact in the world. This memory tied all my loose ends together. It made me realize that the work I do has always been about shattering the silence and giving a voice to the voiceless by finding a new way of freedom. Being a white girl from the Midwest, I knew everything about freedom without even really truly knowing what freedom was. I was just simply free. I wasn't at risk of being sold off by my parents to an old man down the street for marriage. According to UNICEF, 15 million girls will be married off before the age of 18. However, at that age, I could have been at risk of being trapped by the pretend love of a man much older than me who would lure me from my home by showering me with gifts and while making me feel safe. I could have been forced into sex slavery, but thank God this did not happen to me. But what about the 4.5 million people who are victims of sexual exploitation? Trapped inside of the $99 billion industry. How can we crack this globally tied, low risk, high gain code? These perpetrators are not gonna give up on the money so easy and walk away. The sad truth is, a great number of these men who run this industry are most likely abused and forced into this life as well much like Winston's story. Neither side knowing that the other side are victims led by the past generations that date back before time began. How can we collectively in this room break the cycles of abuse? CNN has produced a show, as Chef mentioned, called Sex Trafficking, The Horror and the Hope. They state that sex trafficking can be ended. Awareness is the first step. The light bulb came on to me and I said, this is my driving passion, to produce and direct films, series, and projects that have to do with bringing awareness and creating transformation for myself and hopefully for others. I realized that through my career, I was drawn to producing films and projects that weren't necessarily mainstream, but came from grassroots efforts that modeled new forms of social behavior and could tell a story that led us through a positive social change and integration of the spirit due to the written and spoken word. I wanted to be part of telling better stories. 
and be a part of transformation. So why the film Age Redemption? The story is about a young woman who is in search of her own redemption. The character of Samantha resonated with me because I had to learn many ways of how to work through various cultures, respecting their cultural differences, much like Samantha had to do in Nigeria. Samantha was eventually able to work with a young chief in the village to discuss issues like child marriage, another statistic that needs to change. Sometimes child marriage is forced in culture, and sometimes it's tied to being sold young girls into marriage. They're then forced into sex labor. <coughs> Knowing the statistics, that there's 20 countries that still allow for men to marry young girls, drives me to continue to promote films like Road to Redemption, because it inspires younger generations of women to learn how to support other women and girls to find ways to ch change laws, much like what Libby and Shima are doing. Congratulations on your work. <coughs> Knowing that 603 million women still live where violence is not a crime, that keeps me up at night wondering where we went wrong in our lives and how I could personally continue to work towards a change. My personal mission is a global change through the power of storytelling. I believe that through combining grassroots, organiz grassroots efforts in the technology and entertainment industries with the NGO arena, the driving force of the United Nations and world leaders like President Mahama of Ghana and President Buhari of Nigeria, who are working to change the laws in their own countries. They're looking to illegalize child marriage. It's countries like that and all of us together to produce films like Road to Redemption and another film that Shevel will be telling you about next. Through this, we can shatter the silence and give a voice to the voiceless. I believe it's then that we can truly create a, a lasting accomplishment of gender equality, race equality, and paint a new face of freedom. And this is for the sake of our humanity. <coughs> I really love this last slide, and I know you're not supposed to read slides, but this one bears reading. What is technology without humanity? And I am so pleased to introduce you to our final panelist today, who is not only responding to that question, but from inside the media world, at the height of it, bringing humanity back to technology. Fred Fuchs is a very dear friend, who worked with Francis Ford Coppola at Zoetrope Films, worked at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and is now working with us. Are we lucky? Thank you, Fred. Thank you very much. Well, I'm very honored to be with all of you today. And before I begin, I just wanted to recognize for a moment all the men who are in the audience today. society and a solution to this incredible problem we have. We need the men and the women working together. And before I talk to you about Operation Big Sister, we all just need to recognize that there is a problem and how much longer are we going to allow this male-dominated media culture to continue to perpetuate this myth that gender inequality is the humanity's natural condition. We all know it's not. And we all know we're entering a new age. The earth is changing, humanity has to evolve. And we all know that this is now the age of Aquarius. And that until we found, find that balance, between the masculine and feminine energy, between male and female empowerment, we will never achieve peace on this planet. And that's got to be the goal for all of us. So yes, I've been in the media industry for 35 years. I've produced big entertainment Hollywood studio films. I've worked as a network executive at a public broadcaster in Canada. And I'm very, very conscious of the power of media. 
and that how we found, you know, we all want to criticize the media for being this horrible thing, it's desensitizing our children to violence and sex and, and the implementation now and the access to media and cell phones and pornography where, you know, any six-year-old can just click on his cell phone and access all forms of pornography. It's just, we have no idea what that impact is going to have to another generation. And we've got to create a world now where we have conscious creators who are consciously creating media and we have conscious consumers who recognize that there is an impact on what they're consuming. And we have to have conscious parenting and parents who recognize they have a real responsibility in terms of what type of media their children are consuming. But I'm here really to talk about a very exciting project I'm so excited to be involved in that Sheva introduced me to, and it's called Operation Big Sister. And the inspiration, of course, is a true story of this very courageous group of women in Iceland, who you'll hear more about, who saw a problem and decided not to just sit by and let it perpetuate but to organize and get up and do something about it. And when I heard this story, I said to myself, this is an opportunity to do a very big, entertaining feature film. Because it had all the elements of great drama that we always look for in feature films. And it had great humor and great characters and a great inspirational ending as well. And that was our first, and that's where we began. So we optioned the rights to this, these women's story, and we developed a feature script, and we want to use this feature film to bring a spotlight to this story. And I refer to Spotlight because as some of you might know, there has recently been a film called Spotlight about the horrible story of what went on in Boston with the Catholic priests and the abuse of these children for all these years. And we also know that the success of that film, including winning the Academy Award, has now brought about a huge change, not just in terms of the media, but thousands of young of men who were abused are now coming out and feeling free to tell their story, which they could not talk about. So there's something about how this media and how this story can empower people that is very exciting to me. But of course, we want to do more than just do a feature film. We know that the feature film will be a way to reach people about this horrific story of sex trafficking who may not watch a documentary, who may not go to an online website, who may not be open because this is a very you know, emotionally scary subject. And a lot of people just aren't equipped to even listen to this story. But if we do this in an entertaining way, it's presented properly, we think we can reach a large audience about this subject. And we're hoping we can attract them, create an emotional experience, and create a door that then they want to step through to learn more. And that's why concurrently we're producing this documentary. And we're actually here with a film crew this week, shooting interviews, talking to people, finding out other stories of other people who are doing great work, in this field, dealing with this subject, and their stories will all become part of this documentary. Then the last part, of course, is the digital educational platform, because we'll also be creating other ancillary content, which will then provide real tools to people working in the field to help with education and awareness. And it'll be a virtuous circle because each of these different media forms will support the other ones as well. So this is our dream, this is our goal. We're really at the beginning. We need everybody's love and support and help. And um, you guys are all one of the first to hear about it, and we're very excited to be able to introduce more of this to you. But this is very much Sheva's story. So please join me, Sheva, because I want you to tell about how it all first came into your life. Well, and the truth is, it's not my story. But we'll get to that in a moment. So, I attended my first Commission on the Status of Women three years ago. It's 
sitting in these rooms that you're sitting in today. This is the launch point for you. 10 days into it, and we'll see how you feel on the 23rd for those who are sticking it out the whole time. 10 days into the, my first commission on the status of women, being a middle-class white girl that came here very highly educated, thinking we had gender equality. And I should be embarrassed to tell you that, but instead of being embarrassed to tell you that, I decided to make a feature film that would let other people like me, in our educated ignorance, know the real that's going on. And what inspired that moment was that on my 10th day here, I was so depressed. <laughs> you can relate. Those of you who've been here before, you know what I was going through. The facts, the figures, the issues. Meeting after meeting, being bombarded by the true information when I had lived in the illusion. I couldn't get off my chair to go to, you know, the CSW handbook. It circled all the things I wanted to go see. The last day, I just sat at the Salvation Army on the pew and I couldn't move. I was in a stupor. And so I didn't move. And I'm so glad I didn't. Because into that room and onto that stage for the next panel walked a woman that created for me a defining moment of my life, a defining moment of love and empowerment. And she stood there, and I have a terrible Icelandic accent. But she said, enough! In Iceland, women don't just sit around whining about these things. We get up off the couch and do something about it. And she proceeded to tell me the story of Operation Big Sister. That in Iceland, women fought for 10 years to pass legislation that would decriminalize women whose bodies were being sold so that they could get access to social services. We have to acknowledge that prostitution is the only crime in which the victims of the crime are labeled criminal. decriminalize women and criminalize the buyers and sellers of sex and I heard Winston say on camera to me in front of the United Nations yesterday that he believes he should have gotten a much longer sentence when he went to prison that that would have made a difference and Icelandic women passed legislation to make that happen but when they did and celebrated with champagne as only the big sisters know how to do the next thing that happened is the chief of police in Iceland got on TV and said, ha, prosecute prostitutors, buyers of sex. Prostitution is the oldest profession in the world. We're not gonna waste our time doing anything about that. And besides, we don't have any money. At a point when many of us would have given up in despair, that's when the Icelandic women went into action and took matters into their own hands. And Gudrun Jonsatir of Iceland <laughs> partnered with a young graduate student at Stigamat, Iceland's Rape and Sexual Violence Crisis Center, and together they said, all right, if the normal vectors of change aren't gonna work right now, we have to innovate. So they took out ads online and in print media, just like the traffickers do. Why not? If they can, we can. Selling themselves. And when men called to buy sex, they said, this is your big sister watching you. <laughs> <laughs> and this grew through what the Icelandic women call the jungle telegraph, kitchen table to kitchen table. It spread virally, and women who didn't even know each other started doing it. And pretty soon, it was a movement. 85 women and more. This is your big sister watching you. <laughs> Successfully destabilized the buying and selling of sex in Iceland because men when they called to buy sex didn't know if they would get instead their mother or their wife or their sister or their girlfriend on the phone. And because their anonymity was their power when they held a press conference and marched the names 
of the men who had called them to buy sex and their phone numbers and information to the police chief's desk, they wore neon burkas to protect their anonymity, to perpetuate their Operation Big Sister. They did other amazing antics too, uh, like sending the men to the police chief's house for services. <laughs> He didn't have the money to investigate. It was very helpful. <laughs> and of course, they had to come up with a clothing line. We're very excited in the feature film about them for our merchandising. That's an important part of Hollywood, right, friend? So uh, we will model after the Big Sisters merchandising. I am responsible boxer shorts. <laughs> which I hear the mayor of Reykjavik and now the previous police chief who was against them in the beginning proudly wear. But this is not my story. This is not my story. This is the big sister story. And I'm, I'm just gonna actually skip this next slide. You're gonna see this sort of subliminally. This is what we're about. We're about creating conscious creation, but also making new choices about the media we consume. And the Big Sisters empowered a pattern interrupt across their entire nation to wake men up to what they're consuming and to wake women up to what we're consuming and change that. This is our story. The power of media is something we're marinating in all the time. Imagine if little girls heard the big sister story as their fairy tale instead of Cinderella. <laughs> media affects the behaviors. We role model after media. And it currently is portraying shocking objectification of all of us. And we can change that. It has been the poison. We are a stand today with the big sisters that it's going to be the antidote and as the antidote that we can tell these amazing stories, true stories of real people making a real difference in the world and inspire others to do the same. This is also the story of the trafficked survivors. And we're ending on this slide. I have a whole new appreciation for the color of the sky because when you're in bondage, everything is gray. I suggest to all of you here Traffic survivors are not the only one in bondage. Our minds are in bondage when we are enslaved to the media. And we can change that by choosing what we consume and choosing to create a new demand for new conscious production. Finally, I just have to say, the big sister story is not my story, but I'm privileged that that story changed my life and we hope it changes the minds of others. The big sister story is the big sister story. Good. Thank you. So, okay. Well, I will not. I was not prepared to speak, but that's true. Seven. I we met three years ago and she wrote to me afterwards and I always thought she must be princess. princess. <laughs> and whenever I was looking for signs that she had to be crazy, she she did something incredible, just like today. And um, she, she she has been making things happen. I still can't believe it what we what we did at my kitchen table when I was trying to convince the buyers that I was 32 and the, the <laughs> but, uh, she took over. It's amazing. Thank you for all this and the best of luck. Thank you all. I hope you sign your name on our sign-up sheet because we need every person possible to partner with us in this movement. Everyone can be a big sister, even the men in the room. And um, we are here filming this week, so if you have a story about human trafficking to share, please see Robert, who's in the corner over here. We are going into a meeting right after this 
about the curriculum we're developing with partnering NGOs that is part of the Transmedia for Operation Big Sister. We will try to meet with as many of you as we can in the hallway, but if you miss us, please see Robert, because we want to connect with and partner with you. Thank you for giving your attention to this issue this morning. I so appreciate it. And thank you to all our panelists. You guys are my heroes.